thank you so much for coming, Ro, at the last minute. I really appreciate it. I've interviewed you bunches of times. And My honor. Thank you so much. He has a great book. He does. I interviewed him about it in New York. Um, so let's start. We will sell your books in a second. Um, but let's start talking about this issue of what's happening. I interviewed John just recently when I had Sway about uh, the money he's given to Nin 90 days ago. 90 days ago. Talk a little bit about, I, not everybody listened to it, so talk about what you've been doing at Stanford and your commitment to this issue. You have been in green investing for a while, some of which hasn't worked very well. Talk about what got you to funding probably the first major school in this area. It's, it's the first new school at Stanford in 70 years. Mm -hmm. And I got started in this when my 15-year-old daughter, Mary Dorr, yelled at me after mm -hmm. watching Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. She said, Dad, your generation created this problem. You better fix it. I had friends over for dinner. The room went silent. I had no idea what to do or how to respond to her. Mm -hmm. So I set out with Kleiner Partners. And over six or seven years, we invested about a billion dollars in 100 different climate tech companies. Mm -hmm. That billion dollars today, for the record, is worth about $3 billion. Mm -hmm. But we were really trying to understand what it would take to solve the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, I honestly got renewed engagement when you did an interview with David Wallace. Wells. Wells, Wells thank you mm -hmm. very much. And he wrote about the uninhabitable planet. And uh, when you and I spoke, Kara, just three months ago, I told you that one of the things we needed to do was win the politics mm -hmm. and win the policy. And you took a fair look at what our prospects were and said, fat chance. Right, I did say that. <laughs> yes. I feel like that was okay, a okay guess. It was okay, and it was with credit to Roe and Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin that a small number of leaders put together this remarkable, historic Inflation Reduction Act, which is really the first truly significant federal climate legislation that we've had in the country in decades. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Congressman, do you want to tell us what those conversations were like with Senator Manchin and others as you were trying to put this deal together at a time when a lot of us thought that nothing might happen? Sure. Let me just say one thing, because John is being characteristically modest. He, he and Ann gave $1.1 billion to set up the first climate school at any major university. It's, it's as if someone founded the first medical school. And, and the reason it's worth saying this, because Kara and I have had a lot of conversations about all the negative things that come out of Silicon Valley. I hope this inspires more tech leaders to do things that are going to make a positive impact. So it's significant. Uh, you know, I knew Senator Manchin because I'd gone down to Beckley and we had done a program of tech jobs there. And so we had a relationship mm -hmm. since 2017. Was that Silicon Holler? That, no, that was down in Paintsville. But, oh, okay. he, you know, Gordon G is there. and. Uh, John Chambers has a relationship. A lot of people in Silicon Valley actually have a relationship there. And so I, I, I just had the simple approach, is I didn't go out and call him corrupt, and I didn't call him uh, you know, names on television, because I thought if you want to get his vote, it's probably best to engage. And so when he walked away from, he called me on New Year's Day of 2022, and he was furious that he was being blamed by everyone in the party. And I said, let's just keep talking. Uh, I believe if you have a 300 billion north of 300 billion climate investment, uh, the progressives will be a yes and the groups will get there. Then we sat through many meetings, many bipartisan groups. Senator Schumer deserves enormous credit for getting in there. He's the one who did the deal and the president. My only role was to say, hey, there's someone reasonable. The progressives and environmental groups will be reasonable. And he called me uh, uh, right after the deal. And to, to uh, my word, the progressives and the environmental groups came out for it. When, let me ask, when you think about that, though, it was, it was stopped, right? This bill was stopped. It was what, dead. Was it because people were mean to him? Or what was, the, what was the reason it was dead and what pushed it through? Because I can't imagine this man hasn't dealt with people who are mean to him in his life. You know, in fairness, I got a lot of criticism when I said, give Joe Manchin the pen. Mm -hmm. But the reality was that what he was saying back in December is around a 2021 is around what the deal we ended up with. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that he was going to be for the carrots, for the innovation. 
he wasn't going to be for the sticks. I wanted some of the sticks, but that was just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened is that people came around to, to a recognition that what Joe Manchin was for was historic, was historic. It's transformational. World changing. I mean, we, we have zero battery production in the United States, we basically. Do. It's a bit more or less zero. I mean, Tesla has some, but China produces 80% of the batteries. You talk to Jigger Shah and the 40 billion that has been authorized under this bill in the Advanced Vehicle Technology Program, and your hundreds of applications now to produce battery plants in the United States. There are $250 billion allocated of loans for energy investments and infrastructure for uh, re revitalizing utilities. There are tax credits that are gonna bring solar manufacturing back. It's extraordinary when you look at the breadth of private capital that's gonna be unleashed. John, you wrote a book, Speed and Scale, this year. You laid out a 10-point plan for addressing the climate crisis. I'm curious, um, when you look at the, the plan you advocated and what's in this bill, where's the most overlap? Like, what, like how, what, what in this bill you, do you think moves us further in the direction you, you want us to go? Well, this is an Oprah moment. Mm -hmm. I put a copy of this plan on everybody's seat. Oh. I encourage you to pull it up. If it was an Oprah moment, it would be an electric car. But <laughs> So, so there are six areas, and broad agreement, by the way, that this is how we deal with the climate crisis. Um, Andy Grove would call these objectives, Jim Collins would call them big, hairy-ass goals. <laughs> but we electrified transportation, we decarbonize the grid, we fix the food systems, reduce voluntarily the amount of beef we eat, mm -hmm. how we do agriculture, protect nature, that's stopping deforestation and deep ocean trawling. Clean up industry, this is really hard, make cement and steel without emitting carbon. Mm. And then, this is 59 gigatons per year of pollution that we're dumping in the atmosphere like it's some kind of free and open sewer. If we do the maximum we can to reduce these, the science tells us we're still gonna have to remove 10 gigatons per year of stubborn, gnarly carbon. And we'll do that through natural means, planting more trees, and through mechanical, mechanical means, direct air capture, that's called. Now, your question to me was Well, how that seems easy. <laughs> well, e each, one, each one of these is a, a it, I get it. You get it? Yeah. <laughs> this is bigger than World War II. Mm -hmm. Mobilizing the world's resources to make a new clean energy economy. And it's as consequential, it's as existential. And not if these weren't hard enough already, but we've got to do this quickly. And so, again, in your oh. seats, there are four accelerants, which is how we get this done in time. We've got to win the politics and policy, which is what happened with the IRA bill by one vote. We've got to turn movements into action. So Greta Thunberg isn't just protesting, she's actually changing public sentiment. So is, is Doug McMillan of Walmart. We've got to innovate like crazy. We need to deploy now more of what we have that works, but that's not gonna get us to net zero by 2050. We need the new as well. And so we've gotta innovate and invest like our lives depend upon it because it does. Now finally, these goals are broadly agreed to. There's nothing very con controversial about them. What's different about this plan is that for every one of these objectives, there are three to five specific, measurable, accountable, time-bound, Andy Grove would call them, key results, and we track all these. The biggest area for gains, $30 billion of gains, is from decarbonizing the grid. And there's $19 billion of direct funding in the IRA that applies to that. Mm. Fixing the food system will get us seven gigatons reduction, and there's $20 billion in the IRA for climate support. And I could go through every mm -hmm. one of these. Mm -hmm. What I will say to our audience that's viewing this is this plan's available for free, it's on the website, speedandscale.com. You can download it. Um, the, the, let me ask you the question then. So let me yeah. take this from you for a second. Um, this part, which is innovate and invest right here. Right. Because there are the policy issues no matter what you do. Um, where is Silicon Valley now if you call this World War II for the greatest, the amount of attention? You have been trying to do this for a while and they continue not to do, not to invest here. We're spending the whole day tomorrow talking to some startups. It's, it's gonna be fantastic, and we have terrific startups we're talking to. Where this is on the innovation agenda is we need to increase four times of capital. 
We've got to increase venture capital, and the plan calls for growing when it was written from 13.6 billion to 50 billion per year. That happened last year. Mm -hmm. We're ahead of plan. Okay. Most of that funding is going into the transportation sector, into batteries and vehicles, but we're also seeing those applied to decarbonizing the grid. Uh, besides venture capital, we need more government R&D. Bill Gates has been yelling for that for a long time. We need to increase government incentives. The, the Inflation Reduction Act does that. We need more project finance and more philanthropic investing. Someone in this amazing conference of yours put up, I think that there's $700 billion of mm -hmm. American philanthropy. Only 2% has gone to climate. Mm -hmm. The right, vast so amount goes to medical schools, education causes, because they're more tangible. We, we, we need to raise it to 20%. So, uh, Ro, when you're doing this to get people feeling like this is a crisis, which you don't want to, people don't like being, we've been through, we just were through a big crisis and people are on edge already with a lot of anxiety. How do you focus them on it? Because it's this amorphous thing that maybe you see in a movie like The Day After Tomorrow or, or something like that, but it's not something tangible for people to understand in the same way. And so they tend to invest one of the things I used to say, and John, you and I talked about it, is Silicon Valley is a lot of smart people doing stupid things, like <laughs> investing in stupid things. Some are fine, a dating service, great, you know, whatever. But it was never these serious things. Um, how do you, first for you, from you, from a Silicon Valley point of view, but from a political point of view, how do you get people focused? Because there's still a huge resistance, even though you passed this, and congratulations, I'm glad I was wrong about fat chance. But it was a fat chance. You were very lucky in the way things came together. How do you continue to get them focused on this? Like talking about production. We made a strategic mistake in this country for 40 years. Mm -hmm. We said that we could invent things here, we could win the Nobel Prizes, we could have the professors, mm -hmm. and it didn't really matter where things were produced. And so we invented the battery at University of Austin and MIT, and we let China produce it, and we shipped off our textile industry. We, ship, we can't make masks in America. We can't make baby formula in America. And it's led to the deindustrialization of large parts of the country. It's, in my view, led in part to the polarization and what I've said is, let's have a new economic patriotism to build things. But if you just say, we're going to build things, and it's the same economy of the 50s or 60s, people won't believe you. But if you say, look, we're going to build things, and we're going to build it with technology, and we're going to build a new battery plants here, and we're going to build the new electric vehicles here, we're going to have solar manufacturing here, and we're going to have the new steel here, people understand that. And they understand that those are good jobs. Mm -hmm. We're going to build semiconductors. I'm going to with President Biden to Columbus in two days. We're going to open up two semiconductor factories. So this should be, in my view, about jobs, about manufacturing. And the clean part is, is how it's going to be built. Mm -hmm. But that's how, in my view, you, you convince people. I'd be curious to know what you hear from your constituents and whether there's a generational divide. I talk to people under 25, and climate is almost all they want to talk about. But I can you know, see maybe you're older and you feel like you've got a little bit less to lose. Are you noticing a generational divide? Or like is the fact that we almost had rolling blackouts here yesterday finally starting to get we people's attention? We could have one today, so hush. Oh, well, yeah, the night is young. <laughs> I think there is a generational divide. In how, and it, it occurred to me actually just a couple months ago, I was a, with a journalist's daughter, and we were having dinner, and she's 18 years old, and we were talking about family and kids, and she said, I don't want to have kids. Yeah. And she said, uh, I said, it's one of the most joyful things in the world. Yeah. I, I really do. I believe I wouldn't trade it for anything. And she said, I don't know if I can bring kids into the world, given climate. And then she talked about other social issues. This is so personal for the younger generation. This is the issue that they think is most gonna affect their lives. So there is a stake and an urgency that they feel and a passion that they feel that is much deeper, uh, a much higher priority than I think people in a and different is that generation. is bipartisan be, among all? Because you talked about the polarization. I don't know, I don't have data on it, but I, do th I, I will say this, that there are uh, younger generation Republicans who understand that the party can't be a climate denying party uh, or they're going to lose a lot of younger voters. And the uh, challenge for us in, in, in is how do we make this actually bipartisan? And if you frame it as uh, not just tackling a, an enormous crisis, but uh, an opportunity to rebuild the uh, American productive capacity 
to restore American preeminence. Uh, that's a message that cuts across the aisle. John, talk about the school. So the idea of a lot of people when we talked said you could have took take near $1.1 billion and spent it elsewhere on this. There's other ways to do it. Why did you do a school? Why do you, you said this is good computer science. This is going to be the new computer science or it's going to replace computer science. Yep. Climate science. This is what they're saying on campus. Climate science will be the new computer science. Mm -hmm. There'll be, for the entrepreneurs, more than a thousand unicorns in this field. This is what Larry Fink predicts. This is what uh, Gates Breakthrough Energy Venture Fund believes. Uh, if you go on the campus, what you find, what I found, what persuaded me was that they were incredibly strategic and very thoughtful about their place in the world, their obligation to society, and the challenge that this uh, puts before the school. They did two years of deliberative polling and consensus building among faculty, among students, among administration. Uh, Mark Tessier-Levine, who's the CEO, a neuroscientist who ran Rockefeller University and ran large parts of Genentech, said he wants this school to show that we can make a new kind of university that's organized to solve the pressing problems of today. We're not gonna solve the climate crisis by having more specialized silos of expertise like synthetic biology, poly chem poly polymer chemistry. We need to bring in the social dimensions, the environmental justice, the political science, the engineering to what their three-part structure is set up to optimize. And uh, the, the world's watching. We need lots of great schools of climate science, just like we have lots of great medical schools. So they have a new set of accelerators that will fund projects, political science projects, mm -hmm. technical projects, on the road to getting venture capital through the so-called valley of death. They have institutes, multidisciplinary ones, and new ones they're creating. 90 faculty started September 1st as part of this new school. So this isn't a raw startup, we're getting going. They intend to add 60 more over the next decade. Thousands of graduate students, undergraduates who want to minor in it. I, it, it the, the, the excitement on the campus, it's electrifying, pardon the pun. <laughs> the, pe pe the students want to do the right thing for the right reasons. They see great jobs, they see a way to make a difference. And uh, you know, I looked at some of the data for Stanford. Over the last 50 years, Stanford graduates have founded 39,000 companies, mostly in information tech. Mm -hmm. We need to create that kind of ecosystem around climate solutions, and that's what they're doing. When you were earlier doing this, it didn't work as well. I remember sitting with you talking about green tech. Oh, what's hard. changed? Well, what, what's changed is there's, <laughs> as of 10 days ago, $360 billion worth of incentives from the wealthiest nation in the world, the world's alpha polluter, we put out more carbon pollution than anybody in the world. And, 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 and so there's demand, there's need. What's changed is it's 110 degrees in California. What's changed is we're realizing it's cheaper to save the planet than to ruin it. Go ahead, Scott, Casey, go ahead. Uh, sorry, let me ask you another question. When you think about this, when, if the house is flipped, which most people think it will, we don't know yet. Well, I, mean, I, I would okay. have told you two months ago, I would have said that's true. I think right. we've got some momentum. Right, but this is not a party that's focused on that. They're focused on investigating Anthony Fauci or what, whatever they've been saying, all the nonsense they've been spewing, the things they're gonna do. How do you get that group involved in it in a party that will be running that, that, that part of the government um, focused on this with the kind of urgency that's needed? I go back to the message of production. What did Donald Trump run on? He said, our jobs have been offshored. We've got structural trade deficits, okay? We had a trade deficit about 1% in the 1990s after WTO. The trade deficit moved up to about 5% of GDP. It's about 3% of GDP. We've got a, tr a huge trade deficit with China. By the way, if you care about peace with China, the worst thing we can have is structural trade deficits. That was the cause of the opium war. And you say, okay, you had four years the trade deficits increased with China. I wanna have a trade surplus in this country. We haven't had one since 1975. Tell me a way that we're going to get a trade surplus if we don't lead in clean tech production, if we don't lead in clean tech exporting. I'll tell you, if we are mo mo making the batteries in this country, if we're making the electric vehicles, if we're making the solar powers, if we're exporting that, that's our best shot 
That's our best shot to have a trade surplus again. If you care about reversing any American decline, if you care about actual American economic leadership, you've got to be for this. Breakthrough batteries are the microprocessor of the clean tech revolution. Mm -hmm. You know what the estimated size is of the market for advanced batteries? $400 billion per year mm -hmm. for 20 years mm -hmm. to replace the petroleum infrastructure that we're using to power our vehicles. You know what the online advertising market is? Everything that Facebook and Google are fighting over? Mm -hmm. $75 billion a year. Mm. Better batteries is four times bigger than that. That's the opportunity. And, and these batteries got to improve. They've got to be cheaper. They've got to last longer. They got to recharge faster. Mm -hmm. It's up I mean, look, I was, there was a Donald Trump rally, right? And he's talking about bashing China, China, China. And then he says, well, why would anyone drive an electric vehicle? I was like, okay, so you want China to win the electric vehicle mm -hmm. market? I mean, there is a, at some point, the, 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 the people are going to wake up and say, okay, if we want to have America lead in these areas, we've got to get in the game. So how do you do that with, with them? Because he just did that and it seemed perfectly logical to the group that was listening to him, I believe. I think we have to do a couple things. We have to be more explicit of an appeal to patriotism. There's nothing wrong with cheering it for America. And let's be honest, for a lot of time, folks in Silicon Valley spend more time flying to Ireland and flying to Berlin than flying in to the middle of this country. So I mean, many people did. Mm -hmm. And there was a mistake made of a lot of neglect. And we ought to say 40 years, we did not pay enough attention to deindustrialization. We did not pay enough attention to factory towns. We did not pay enough attention to rural communities. And when we go, th when you go there, they don't believe that the battery factories are going to be there. They don't believe that the semiconductor factories are going to be there. They don't believe that the supply chains are going to be there. We need to be far more deliberate not just to produce these jobs, but to produce them in towns that have faced deindustrialization and to show that we get it, that it is fine to root for America. You brought up Silicon Valley. Uh, we have a lot of CEOs from the big tech companies here at this conference. Um, what role would you like to see them play in, in cleaning this up? What, how can they help? So I'm gonna jump in here because right now, big tech is setting the pace for reduction in carbon emissions from their own operations because it's good business, it's good with their employees. To cite just a couple of examples, uh, Alphabet has declared that by 2030, they will emit no carbon. I'm not talking about buying offsets. I mean, no carbon molecules to run their entire operation. Apple has pulled forward its net zero commitments to 2040. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Amazon has organized the Climate Pledge, which is 200 companies that say they'll get to net zero by 2040. So having said that, we've got a long way to go. 500 Fortune 500 companies. You know how many have made net zero pledges against all scopes of emissions by 2040? Mm -mm. 10. Mm. And so this plan is an action tracker. You can log on to the website. We can hold people accountable and track their progress against it. What I'm trying to say is this is the most important work of our lives. We've made a remarkable step forward with the IRA bill. We've got a long way to go. So what's next? What do you actually need next? And then we're gonna get some questions from the audience. What is, what is needed now? You passed this bill, and some people didn't think it was enough. As you know, this always happens in Washington. What, what do you now, think? Now, now we need deployment. The, the Department of Energy, it's estimated, needs to hire 1,000 people just to deal with the infrastructure bill, not the IRA bill. The EPA has been gutted for talent. They have to regulate now. We're not gonna do this all with carrots. We're gonna need sticks to get the job done. We're gonna need more international engagement. We need John Kerry to work to raise the goals for the rest. The United States is not gonna solve this problem on our own. I don't see how we solve it without American leadership though. Mm -hmm. What do you think? We need execution. One of the things I think Silicon Valley, they've done an enormous job now of investing in new startups. Actually, I was reading somewhere of the 20 leading startups in the climate space, 10 of them are in Silicon Valley, but it's not going to be enough uh, to think that the private sector can do this alone. A lot of these projects will require public finance. They need to say, okay, look at what is available actually at the DOE. We need to tell people that Tesla wouldn't have existed if it weren't for government finance, the Silicon Valley wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for DARPA and Bell Labs and, uh, and NSF. There is a, 
a, a myth in the valley that it's just the uh, bootstrap up by the bootstraps entrepreneur who's creating all the value. Actually, the government has been a partner to that. And to solve climate, it has to be the private sector in collaboration with DOE, with the government. Uh, and we now have to execute on that. This looks like a book. It is not a book. OK. It is a plan. Mm -hmm. And this book was written for the leader inside everyone. Because we're past the point where individual virtue, we're going vegan or putting up solar panels, is going to get the job done. We need everybody to look in the mirror, find their source of personal power. We need each of you to take your personal platforms and use this to move us towards collective action. The closing quote in this book is from Lorreen Paul Jobs. And she says, the climate crisis should be looked on as the greatest opportunity that humankind has ever had to deal with great social wrongs, to deal with economic justice, education equality, to do, deal with severe disease. This is a call to arms, the Times Now. So last question, and we're going to questions. Right now, we're undergoing California, the heat, Jackson, water. Um, people are seeing it. What does it take for people to actually, because usually people respond to a crisis, like the pandemic or whatever it happens to be. Is there, does there have to be a massive disaster or, or these slow moving ones that people suddenly realize? And I get that young people get it, but the people in power seem to ignore it almost continually. Well, we need more of these young folks in politics, running for office, getting into Congress, getting into positions. I mean, they get it. I mean, the, and the reality is, I give a lot of credit to the activists, to the Sunrise Movement, to Sierra Club, to the NRDC, because they are the ones who made climate the priority. Look, there are a lot of things I wanted in the bill that weren't in there, universal preschool, childcare. Why is it that the stand that the entire caucus made was on climate? It's because young people were protesting in Nancy Pelosi's office to, to, and being criticized for that. They were protesting in Senator Schumer's office. They won primaries by organizing for Ed Markey. And believe me, politicians respond to electoral pressure. And the young folks deserve the credit for elevating this. And any Democratic politician knows that if they ignore climate, they're going to lose the primary. And I rather rely on their self-interest and ambition than on their good judgment. And speaking of self-interest, John, I wrote a column a couple years ago, if you remember, where I said the world's first trillionaire is going to be a climate you did. change. I made that up. Um, <laughs> I did. Stick with it. I will. And is, is, that, that, the, is that your secret? Did yes, you I make it. No, no, I'm very accurate. But I did make it up. I was, it was more of an aspirational thing because I was like, okay, this is what I think will happen. This, I, it could happen. And I was trying to appeal to people's greed because nothing else was working. Um, and so greed works really well. Do you think the world's first trillionaire will be a climate change? And not the way it was in the movie, um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie on Mars. Uh, total Recall, of Total course. Recall, where it's, uh, it's because they control the air, which I don't want Elon Musk to control the air <laughs> of Mars, for example. Um, do you think it's because of something, that this will be uh, 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 the I, next Silicon Valley? I believe this will be the next Silicon Valley. I'm not sure I believe that there's going to be a world trillionaire. Oh. in addressing these markets. But you asked, what do we do? Go to your plan, key result 8.1. Voters <laughs> should make the climate crisis a top two voting issue in the 20 top emitting countries by 2025. That's two years from now. We can do that. It is a top issue in seven European countries now, thanks to a Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg. 8.2, get a majority of government officials elected or appointed to support the drive to net zero. 8.3, let's get 100% of the Fortune 500 companies committed immediately to get to net zero. And you should have a hall of shame. You should call on these people. Okay, I can do that. You, you got a new podcast. You like a fun anyone. question. I know, yes. Them. Who sucks today? Yeah. That sounds like me. All right, questions from the audience for John and Ro? Right here? Hi. Uh, I have a pretty list. significant. I have a pretty significant theory that climate change is a symptom and not a cause. So I believe that it's a symptom of a failure of peer-to-peer -peer relationships and people not caring about other human beings and corporations not caring about other human beings. So I want to know, are you or any other thought leaders heading any efforts that are working on fixing peer-to-peer -peer relationships so that we can affect climate change? So there's a big communications component 
to the work that Stanford is doing and intends to do. And I believe in the end, this is a crisis of behavior modification. We're, we're gonna have to make some sacrifices, but the gain in terms of a more just, equal and habitable planet, not only for ourselves, but for our kids is incalculable. You know, there's an, an old proverb, it goes like, we inherit the earth from our ancestors. Not quite so. We're borrowing it from our children. Right. That's the way to think about it. Hi there, my name is Laura Zapata. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Clear Loop. It's a climate tech startup, and I'm speaking tomorrow, so I really appreciate the, the clarity uh, of your plan. Um, my question is, um, this, this plan is very, very clear, but we are spending a lot of time on number six, talking about removal of carbon. Um, that generates lots of headlines. It's what tech companies are talking about. And so I'm curious to hear from you um, how you get your peers in the VC world and the tech world to think about technologies that already exist and it's just a matter of deploying more of them like solar and wind power. Uh, we just have to hammer that message home. It's absolutely true. We have, my friend Al Gore likes to say, we have all the technologies we need now to solve this problem. We just need deployment. Well, we don't have quite enough technologies to get us all the way to net zero by 2050, but he's right. We need both the now and the new, and this plan embraces both. And if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, most of the incentives are for solar, for wind, for electric vehicles. It's not for carbon removal. I mean, there's some, but that's a minor part of the, the bill. So I think the incentives will be to do what you're saying. Do you know windmills cause cancer? <laughs> To, to follow up on the question of how do you get people to care, John, in your interview with Kara on the Sway podcast, you mentioned that one of the key issues may be the health dimension of climate. And I see in your 10-point plan, there's a little bit of a mention of health in, in terms of health equity, but I was wondering if you could talk more about the health dimensions of climate change in terms of how a worsening climate affects people's health and, and what your views are on that angle of getting more uh, action and more people to care. Thank you. I, I believe the science or the numbers are that there are six million global premature deaths due to carbon pollution. And this is most severe in China and in India, both companies that need more energy, India particularly tackling energy poverty. Our key result 8.5 is simply to eliminate the gaps among racial and social economic groups in greenhouse gas related mortality rates and to do so by 2040. This is measurable. People are working on this. We can, must invest more in focus, prioritize, execute. Ideas are easy. I'm not telling you this is the only plan. I'm not even gonna tell you it's the best plan, but it's an engineer's plan based on interviews with 100 climate experts where the numbers add up and we can do this. This is a reason for hope. My brother, Jack. Hey, um, I know this might not be a popular question in this crowd, but um, you know, like Kieran Calkin in Succession says, the PJs. Um, what, the fact that uh, fuel weighs seven pounds a gallon and a jet burns about 300 gallons an hour, that's about two tons of carbon, one to two tons of carbon per hour for private jet travel. What do you as a, executive uh, in a company where there's a lot of private jets all over this, you know, everyone here, I mean, probably half the people have them. Um, how do you convince Would other Would you raise people? your hand if you have a private yeah, jet? Don't. <laughs> PJ. How, how do you, but the point is not to, to, to denigrate people, but how do you educate people when you see Elon Musk fly from San Jose to San Francisco in a private jet? How do you convince the public that what you're saying is real, that they need to save when people are flying around burning two tons of carbon an hour. Okay. No, well, you're I, the one with I, the I would say, John. Oh yeah, I, mean, I don't have <laughs> one, but, <laughs> but I, can, I can, let me answer it this way. I think the part of the point is uh, we're gonna solve this by uh, ultimately not asking people for deeply behavioral modification and individual virtue. We're gonna solve it by incentivizing hydrogen or sustainable jet fuel, by incentivizing the creation of new production. I mean, you can't say, okay, in America, why don't you just drive less? 
uh, why don't you not uh, go for your Labor Day weekend and, uh, and, and uh, drive cross country? Uh, so I, I mean, I think as a practical matter, uh, what people will respond to is the incentives to build a new economy uh, and the, 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 the technological solutions. The plan calls for 20% of aviation miles by 2025 to be low carbon and 40% by 2040. We do not assume people are going to stop flying. My personal practice is to buy sustainable aviation fuel whenever I can, and when I cannot, I do direct carbon removal and pay so that there's no emissions. Sure, and All right, la last very for. quick question. Uh, thank you very oh. much. I am from the insurance industry. My name is Talisa. And I agree with you that it generally is a generational divide, but people who are in the older generation do care about things that impact their uh, budgets and their wallets. And a very real impact of climate right now is rising costs for things like homeowner insurance because the wet places are getting wetter and the hot places are getting hotter and, I could, and the windy places get windier. So one of my thoughts, as we think about this from an industry standpoint, insurance is a regulated business with very, very big laws about how much you can incent a customer to um, buy insurance. What if we thought broader about that and incented customers for helping us to change the climate future and allowing the categories like insurance that are regulated, which has to be changed at the state level or the national level, to incent them for those efforts, because that's good for them, it's good for their budget, and it's also good for the climate, and the companies who would want to do those incentives want the customers to, we want to all move together with the consumers. Okay, go ahead, John. Uh, insurance companies that aren't pricing climate risk into their business are stupid. And will go out of business. And will go out of business. Okay. All right, one thing everybody can do, I know everybody says that. Is there anything we can do? <laughs> well, before I get off the stage, I want to thank you for 20 years of service to the tech industry. Thank you. And for making this an important part of your platform. Well, thank you, John. I, quick story about John Doerr. When I used to scoop stories with him, he, we used to have a deadline the, the, it was when it was more print uh, publication of midnight typically on the, on the West Coast or even late, around midnight on the West Coast. And every time I have a story that has a company of his that I was completely right about, um, he would call me, he's so polite, he's, you're the most polite person and always an adult and very professional about everything, but he would call me and he'd go, you sure you're right? And then hang up. <laughs> I was Carol, right. what I want to know is how you manage to skewer everyone in Silicon Valley in print, and yet they all like you. I mean, uh, that, they don't that, all like me. <laughs> they don't all like me. Uh, I think one. I think Mark Andreessen, who doesn't like me these days for some reason, whatever, um, said Stockholm syndrome. I think that's probably about right. Anyway, thank you guys so much. In your, in your, in, what, sorry. In your honor for the attendees at Code, if you send an email to me, jdor at speedandscale.com, I'd like to send you uh, a copy of this book. All right, then. There you go. Thank you very much, everyone.